Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Abby Cornett, and I'm the patient advocate for IG Living Magazine. This podcast is brought to you by IG Living Magazine to give readers an opportunity to hear from healthcare experts on topics important to them. In this episode, we will discuss how to stay positive and refuse to let your illness define you. Today, as our guest speaker, we have Debbie Conrad. Debbie is a cancer survivor and a common variable immune deficiency patient who refuses to allow chronic conditions to limit or define her. Debbie is a dynamic individual with a diverse background. Since 1990, she has owned owned and operated her own drapery business. She also has taught ballet for a decade and later became a stay-at-home mom to two sons. Debbie now lives in the Chicago area and enjoys spending time with her five grandchildren and with another one on the way in May. In her free time, she loves reading, traveling, gardening, sewing, and exploring her passion for genealogy. It is my pleasure to have Debbie as my guest. Debbie, you know, I started the company 10 years ago, and Debbie was one of the first patients I had an opportunity to work with when I enjoyed when I joined IG Living Magazine. Her attitude about her diagnosis left a, left a lasting impression on me. Um, she fearlessly advocated, don't let your illness define you, a message that deeply resonated with me, so much so that I suggested she be interviewed for the magazine in 2015. It is this continued passion that led me to chose her for this podcast today. Debbie, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and to tell you how much I've always admired you. Could you please share a bit about your journey with cancer and CVID? And how did you initially diagnose, uh, cope with your diagnosis? And what strategies have you employed over the years to maintain such a positive outlook despite the challenges you faced? It's been amazing to watch. Well, um, I was diagnosed in... 2008 with a rare form of lymphoma, and um, I subsequently received um, two years of rituxan treatment for it, and then after I was done with the treatment, I was having a lot of sinus infections, and um, I knew that the rituxan could, because of the B-cell depletion factor that it, you know, how it treats the cancer. Um, could be responsible. So I asked my doctors and they tested me and they discovered that <clears throat> I have developed um, CVID. And they told me that um, I would need lifelong infusions of, um, um, of immunoglobulin to fight infections. So <clears throat> for me, that diagnosis actually wasn't at the time as daunting as the original cancer diagnosis. And I think part of it was that in the, when I was first diagnosed with my cancer, I was very, very, very angry person, very angry at my body because I'd done everything right. You know, they tell you these are all the preventative things you can do. And <clears throat> I had done everything right, and it, I still got cancer. So my doctors were concerned about letting me know about this this. Um, uh, immune deficiency diagnosis, but my husband had told the doctor when she called it, she thought that he thought I, they'd be surprised at how well I'd handled it. And I did. Um, but that's not to say that I don't have my bad days. You know, I, I had had pity parties. I had, um, with the cancer diagnosis, I went through a period of some depression, um, anx- great anxiety. Um, I was diagnosed with, um, with um, PSD, PSDD, and um, that involved me going to see a therapist who helped me greatly. I mean, it's kind of like the thing with that is that I was never a person that had experienced depression or anything my whole life. Didn't even have baby blues with my kids, and then lo and behold, you know, you're you're kind of faced with this this challenge. And um, it's very hard, I think, very hard sometimes to realize that, you know, our bodies, as much as we can take, we do take care of them and everything, that things go wrong, 
you know, things happen. And what are you going to do about it? So, so my philosophy is how I deal with it is I kind of felt like after I got through the initial two years and then I began to see, I started seeing a therapist. I went to see her, but they also prescribed me a uh, mild antidepressant because one of the treatments they give you for the cancer is they put you on these high dose steroids and high dose steroids do chemical things to your brain. They do a lot of chemical things to your brain. I right. just, I just I am mean, coming off a of high dose of steroids. I, I understand that. Right. One. And it was, it was, but this was like ongoing for three months oh. and I literally suffered in my case, you know, people kept saying to me, Oh, you're going to be the energizer bunny. You're going to love this. Well, I got to a point where I told my husband, if one more person said that to me, I was going to smack them because I was opposite. I, it made me depressed. It made me, um, I, I mean, it made the bad dreams I was having even worse. And, um, but no one told me at the time they put me on them that this messes with the chemicals in your brain, literally. So they did not tell me when I went off of them that I probably should do a mild, a mild, um, a tapering dose. Right. Uh, well, not, I did the tapering dose, but I should also do a slight antidepressant for a little while because they have to correct all that goofy gump junk that's going on. So once I got on the antidepressant, though, it was like within days, I literally felt like, uh, like a cloud just lifted. It was the, the most, it was just the strangest thing ever. Um, <clears throat> so I'm an advocate now for the fact that you know, seeing a therapist is probably a really good thing, especially if you're finding yourself bogged down with feeling like you can't cope with with this whole thing. Um, also, I was kind of more of the positive side person, you know, my whole life I've been that way, more of the cup half full, cup full person. So for me, um, I have a hard time with the idea that I don't call this an illness. I don't call my cancer an illness. I don't call my um, my uh, immune deficiency an illness. I have some other issues that I also am dealing with. Um, I consider them chronic conditions because they all are. And I think that looking at it with a mindset that you're not sick per se helps greatly. Because if you are in the mindset that you're sick, you know, what What do you equate with being sick? Oh, I got to go to bed. I got to do this. I got to do that. Whereas if you look at it as, okay, well, this is like, it's like diabetes. It's like something that you're going to deal with the rest of your life. You have to find a way to make it fit into your life. I, and I, I, I understand that exactly. I, I was just explaining something real similar to my kids because I'm, I'm getting over something. And they said something about, well, your, your condition. And I said, or your illness. And I said, no honey, I'm sick right at the moment. I, I have right. something. You have a cold. You have the flu. I have the right. flu. I'm act, I guess I cut more, look at it more as like a passive underlying condition exactly. versus active illness at the time. And there is, there is a difference. You have to, you definitely have to be on that active condition, that condition all the time and do what you're supposed to do. But if you're not actively sick at the moment, there's, right. there's a difference. Right. Um, and, and you can, Oh, no, no, you go ahead. And I think that um, for me, it's kind of like that philosophy. Um, you, you look at life in a way that when things are thrown at you, you can either allow yourself to be literally sucked into that black hole, you know, that just takes you into the earth and, and, you, and darkness, or you rise above it and you say, okay, well, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to cope? What you, are my coping mechanisms? You literally just act, act, pretty much kind of are morphing into my second question um you you have been such a positive role model and you know you're, you're saying how you look at it how how have you personally cultivated that mindset of resilience and empowerment through your journey because you're one of the most empowered patients that i have you know it's definitely i would say it's definitely been a process and like i said you know initially I mean, I went through a, like a really dark period. Um, he, he, my husband, for instance, you know, he kept saying, oh, I just want my wife back because my mindset was so, part of it was chemical, but part of it was this anger that I felt. I mean, I really, there was, that's no other word I can describe. I was so, I felt so betrayed by my body. And I 
I think at some point you have to just start to realize you can't, you can't be this, you can't be in that place all the time. I had um, a therapist at the hospital actually say something to me one day that really resonated with me. Um, you know, going through all of this, people kept telling me how strong I was. And I kept thinking to myself, well, you know, what choice do I have, right? Exactly. Uh, and I really resented the fact that they were telling me I was strong. So I said this to the therapist, and she said to me, she goes, but you are strong. And I said, okay. And she said, you are here. You're physically going through all these tests, this treatment to get well. She goes, we have patients who literally shut down. They sit on the sofa. They just are, woe is me. They they don't see any any sort of way through it. And, you know, they're stuck. They're stuck and they do nothing to help themselves. They just make their situation worse. So I think that that probably was one of my moments where I sort of did realize at that point that, you know, as much as, yes, I'm going to have to deal with this the rest of my life, I had to find a way to, and this is another another doctor had said to me in the beginning with my cancer diagnosis, he said, what's going to happen is, because I the cancer I have is not a curable so he said, what's going to happen is you're going to get to a point where you're going to be able to put this in a box between, put it in a box and put it away between the times that you have your doctor's appointments and you have your test. And it's going to be, it's there. It's always there. It's always part of your life, but it's not the biggest part of your life. And you know what? He was right. I mean, it just becomes, it becomes part of who you, I, I don't want to say part of who you are, but it's a component of who you well, are. Well, it is, it, you know, and I mean, it is, I, I don't want to be identified by this, no. but it is part of your identity as a person because this is what you're coping and dealing with. You know, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I was, <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, you sound like you kind of had those aha moments. I think we all yeah. have had those. Those aha moments, right. We we have a lot of patients at IG Living that that are um, because of their illness and because of their diagnosis, they they can't interact as actively as other people do, and they're facing some pretty significant issues with isolation and loneliness. Um, have you dealt with isolation and loneliness because of your illness? And if you did, how did you deal with that? And how can you give what advice would you give people that are facing those issues? Well, you know what? In my case, it's funny because when we originally talked and I thought about this question a lot, I I feel like at that first year when I was, before I had my, my um, immune deficiency diagnosis, I probably felt the most isolated then only because I was very sick. I almost died. So that in itself is very isolating. And then not being able to find doctors who could know what to do for me because of my situation. Um, that was extremely isolating, and plus I was so sick that literally I, I slept 20 hours a day. Um, so that isolation, but, you know, that's an, a kind of an unconscious thing. I mean, I went through it. I dealt with it. But once I got to, like, like with COVID, for instance, um, I found it kind of ironic at that point that people were complaining about how much they had to isolate when – this is pretty much our life. I was going to say where people with immune deficiency have been, have been right. dealing with that I mean, for years. We are careful. I mean, I, I don't not do things, but I will say that when I was diagnosed with my cancer, before I even had the immune deficiency thing, they told me I, I, I have to treat my life in a way that, you know, like that I was in chemo. I can't yep. do buffets. I can't go on cruises. I'm, or I, I mean, they're not saying I can't, but they're saying I should probably not. So I, what I do is like during flu season, I have a really good friend. We, we still go out, we eat lunch, we go to a certain place. We know, we know the food there. We know the, you know, the people that are preparing it. Um, I'm careful, but I still, I still socialize. I still live like now, now recently we've had a lot of family weddings and with the COVID thing, I, I have not been going to them um, for the reason that, the one I did go to, I did get COVID last year. So, 
you know, you kind of hedge your bets. But right? with, with, with that and not being able to go to those family weddings, because the, our patients have a lot of those moments where they haven't, they can't go to things. Like I, I was, when I first got really ill, I was shopping on the internet before that was a thing because yeah. I, I right. was too sick to it's go like to the mall. Right, right. So how, well, how did you, how have you dealt with not being able to go to those family weddings and not feeling sad or isolated because of that? Because so many of our patients face that. Yeah. I think that for me, you know, I'll be honest with you. I've always been the kind of person where I've been very comfortable in my own skin as far as um, alone time with myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a lot of hobbies. I enjoy reading. I do a lot of stuff. So I, I, I can, I entertain myself quite well. My dad was in the military. We moved every three years. So I've never had those really in-depth friendships. Um, so to I was going to say, I'm an, I'm an only child, so I understand what you mean. I, I'm perfectly capable of entertaining yeah. myself. So that's the thing. <laughs> and I get it. And I think that, you know, for me, the isolation factor, yes, I, I, I still want to be in contact with people, but um, I can I can deal with the fact that, that I'm not. I mean, like, even now, my my circle of friends is, I've always had a smaller circle of friends. They're more true friends and acquaintances. Um, so for me, that hasn't been a super, a super big issue. But you know what? You have you can FaceTime. Mm -hmm. um, I, have a, I have a cousin who lives, I mean, we're very close. She lives about six hours away. We frequently FaceTime. I was so, going to say, that, know, that's an excellent strategy is you, just because you can't physically see someone in right. person doesn't connect. mean you don't have to you have to give up on those connections. Right. And that's a big thing. I mean, this is what's been wonderful about technology in that regard is that you can connect with people, even people that live in other sides of the world. I have a friend that lives in Paris. She's a, um, a young uh, lymphoma survivor, um, almost died, horrible story she had. She um, and I, we, we FaceTime. So, so, yeah, that technology has really particularly with, the pandemic changed things. Um, I'm going to roll into the next question. Um, as an advocate for yourself and for people um, with your condition, um, how have you, and you've kind of touched on this, refused to let your illness identify you? And what are some of the practical strategies that you have um, found helpful in maintaining a sense of self-purpose beyond your health condition? Um, and how do you know that to balance your illness while also embracing the other aspects of your life? Like you were saying, you you have went, you know, you go out to lunch with your friend, you you FaceTime, but how how have you found that balance? Basically, it's it's very hard for some people to do. And how have you kept from your illness becoming your identity. We touched a little bit on that. Well, I think mostly, um, you know, I, I, I like to go walk, um, get out in nature. And I mean, I know some people don't have the energy to do that, but I just think you do need to find, first of all, stay off the internet. Um, don't be constantly going there to look for reason, you know, for answers to whatever's going on. Just talk to your doctors and all that. I, I don't do support groups, never done support groups. They're, they're not my thing. Um, I, I yeah, cultivate your own interests, your own hobbies. Like I like genealogy. I do that sort of thing. So I try to put my focus away from all things medical. Um, there was a time when I had like a library. Of I was going to say, I think we all do. When we first are diagnosed, we want to find right. out. For me, information is control. Exactly. And once but I have the information, then I can move on from that. Right. But then I, I also found myself, I I think I, I it was like a phase I went through where I kept all the cards from when I was sick and I would go back and read them because they were very affirming. You get to a point where you don't need that anymore. And then so you, little bits get chopped away and you throw that away. And then you replace those things with normal everyday things that you probably did before you ever were diagnosed. You know, or you, or you find new things. I, right. I, I mean, mean, you can, you know, if you want to, I mean, there's a lot of good online things nowadays. I'm sure there's probably book clubs online and there's like, I know, for instance, I, my interest in sewing, I can 
do classes. I was going to say, I, I, one of the things that I, I used to be a big gym maven. Well, the gym is not the greatest place to go. Um, no, I know. It's me neither. So I do online classes. I, I love hiking. So I sw- transitioned. I still get my exercise. I work outside training my dog. There's there's things that you, it, it, given even if you don't have the energy, there's things that you could do, like the online book club. So that, that's an excellent idea. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do. You're, uh, you're, and, and genealogy, for instance, the genealogy, there's a font of of clubs and stuff there are my husband my husband's into genealogy (laughs) so i mean it's just very interesting and i mean history is one of my favorite things so it all ties together but your your story is so so inspiring um in your resilience that i've seen over the years and you know you and i've talked frequently about medical conditions that have came up and you always just face them head on and move through that um what advice would you give to someone that is newly diagnosed with a chronic illness who might be having some real difficulty um, coming to terms with that condition? And how would you advise them to get, work on a mindset that's similar, um, one of empowerment and positivity? And I know you mentioned therapy or a therapist is a very good step. Um, do you have any other suggestions? Well, um, you know what? Uh, cultivate your uh, your friendships. Uh, like. From my case, I have a friend who was a cancer survivor, and she's been one of my biggest advocates. Our friendship actually is probably, you know, cemented more because of this, because she was a two-time cancer survivor. Um, I think, you know, you can maybe seek out people that have similar situations. I mean, I don't know. Um, the therapy thing is, is really good as far as the thing about the therapist is they're an unbiased source. You know, you're dealing with your family and your friends. Which can be frequently more difficult than the it's illness. Very <laughs> very st- My husband, for instance, um, especially when they're control freaks or they can fix everything and they can't fix it. Yes. So you need, you definitely need, and this is what the therapy thing I think is very good because that's a very unbiased uh, person that's removed from your situation. Uh, they can give you coping strategies. And for some people... Support groups might work. Um, I, my experience with support groups has not been so great. Um, I kind of feel like I, you find them, um, you have to find a good one. I was going to um, say, and everybody, because you're probably more self-reliant because of your, your childhood and your upbringing, maybe support groups weren't your way of coping, but right. they, they could but be. But for other people, exactly. they want that camaraderie. And so that is kind of like doing the book club thing. Yeah. I mean, for for a person to, for me, the, the, with, with the thing I think with the support group was that I found that there was a lot of negativity there. People were like, oh, poor me, poor me, and not really being supportive of everybody else or like talking. it. They just wanted to be there and be the star. So, and, but I mean, a good piece of advice might be research and find what's best for right. you as an individual. Right. Like for me, for- hiking, therapy support exactly. groups but it's whatever makes you feel better about yourself try to put yeah try to focus on take your focus away from you being the so-called um condition like i said try not to think of it as an illness i mean we all get sick we do get the flu we do get colds but but to me um sick is that like we were just talking about sick is that sick we are i'm not sick every day I have a condition. I have conditions. You have a condition every day, but you're not actively ill exactly, every day. Exactly. And you can't, you know, you cannot, you, you don't want to become your cancer or your uh, immune deficiency. You, you, you need to find a way to, in, to deal with it in your life, but you also need to find a way just to enjoy life. Because what's the point? You know, you're, you're yeah. working on for finding help and doctors and treatment and everything. The reason why you're doing that is because you want to be able to have a life that doesn't is isn't defined. I was going to say I, I remember having that exact com, uh, conversation with my immunologist because it, you you remember that I was a state senator for eight years. Right, right. And before I ran, he's like, you, "Is this a good idea?" Yeah. And I'm like, "I don't know if it's a good idea, but it's what I need to do for me, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I will work." the rest of that in, if that makes sense. 
I, right. I will, I will, I will make my illness fit my life, not my life right. fit my illness. Exactly. Um, and I think that's what people need to realize with this is that it's to whatever their capability I, is, because I'm fortunate enough. I'm not as sick as a lot of people were. And you've had a lot of illnesses, but you're still healthier than a lot of people. And right. you, you have to tailor your condition and your lifestyle to one another. Right. right. That, that brings us me to my final point. Um, I've always looked to you uh, as my one of my patients that I'm like, that look at how well she has done um, and look how well she does. And you've always been very into advocacy. Um, and when we talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago, you were like saying you needed to get back into a little bit more um, advocacy. How do you see or what are your aspirations for yourself um, moving forward and for the broader community? of individuals um, facing similar challenges? And how do you envision continuing to support both yourself and others in the years to come? And are there any specific initiatives or projects that you that you would like to work on? You know, I would, to be honest with you, I was thinking about that question and I really haven't got to the point where I've given it a lot of thought. I mean, I will continue to, um, you know, contact uh, my elected officials when there's an issue that comes up that's being raised as far as um, legislation. Uh, that's that a very valuable, val valid point. It's something that I, I mean, always... that's kind of pretty much what I've been doing because, you know, like you said, I'm not a person that does the walks. Um, I try to find a way to give back and to be involved. It's like, um, like with the cancer thing, I've volunteered as, you know, kind of a mentor kind of thing for people who are newly diagnosed and, you know, I'll talk to them and, and that sort of thing, support thing. But um, I, I think in itself there, I, I don't know that I want to be the person that's the advocate as far as that's my whole life. You know, you know. What oh, well, no, I, I, I definitely. But like I, but like you said, you encourage people to write letters when the, there's a, right. that's that's a legislative. I, uh, I have I have an, an Instagram page and I I do do that. I post stuff and I say, you know, could you please do this? I say thing on my Facebook page. I'll say, um, you know, this is coming up. Could you, you know, would you mind writing a letter or, you know, signing a petition. I mean, that's, you know, basically, I think that's a big thing. I mean, that's how our voices are heard. And, uh, you know, that's such an important, important point. A lot of people that are patients don't realize how important their voice is, particularly right. to the legislators or people that um, have the power to make decisions over access to care. And even if you can't or aren't physically able to join walks or um, actively yep. be in the community act, uh, advocating, you can write All letters, right. you can do social mm -hmm. media, yep. you can, like you said, mentor people um, that are just newly diagnosed. There's so many ways and opportunities to give back to the community. It's true. And you know what? I think another thing, too, is that when you're, when you're new diagnosed with any condition, um, as a friend of mine, he uh, runs an organization. He started called Immerman Angels. And he had said that the people that come to work for their organization, it, it, it's a cancer organization, they, in about five years, they experience, bur they experience burnout. And um, I think that that probably happens to a lot of us, too. When you go through this, you're, it's phases you're going through. And you, you do. You get burned out. You can't do illness cancer all the time you just can't and it's not healthy no um I, I found that really interesting when he shared that with me because um you know I was at the point where I was doing the mentoring with this organization but then I um I needed to pull back for me you know and but just kind of it, it, it's again it's all about what is right for the individual and at what time for that right. person that balance. Debbie, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, I will continue to, to follow you and hope we have our ongoing conversations every few months like we do. And I want to thank you so much for um, agreeing to do this today. You have, yeah, a, you, yeah, you have such a unique perspective um, as a patient that I wanted you to be our first 
patient we highlight. Uh, a little bit like you were the first person I suggested, what, well, geez, 10 years ago now for uh, the yeah. patient highlight. I have it right in front of me right now. I pulled the, <laughs> I pulled the magazine out. I did too. Uh, All funny. Right. All right. Well, listeners, uh, thank you again for joining us today. Additional information regarding this podcast can be found on our website at www.igliving.com. If you have any questions that was not covered, uh, please contact me at acornet at igliving.com. Look for the next IG Living podcast announcement on our website for the opportunity to submit your questions. IG Living Advocate is a copyright production of IG Living Magazine, published by FFF Enterprises, the only magazine for the immunoglobulin community, comprised of patients who suffer from chronic illness and their caregivers.